Hello, and welcome to a brand new day of free-to-play here on Magic the Gathering Arena. Get the dish on the latest with me, Lord Rumfish. It is official, folks. If you missed my other video, Wizards of the Coast has announced Fallen Empires Remastered is coming to Arena. Not only will it be legal in formats like Historic and Timeless, it is going to arrive in Standard. And so, this is my top 10 list for the most impactful cards from Fallen Empires and how they are going to change the face of Standard as we know it. Let's get started. All right, at number 10, we've got the two land cycles from Fallen Empires. I'm grouping them together here. I think they can both have a role to play in Standard uh, for different reasons. So one is this uh, sack land cycle. They enter the battlefield tapped. You can tap them for a mana of a particular color. You can sacrifice them to make two mana of that color. Now, I can't say for sure if that cycle is going to have a big impact on standard, but I remember many years ago um, that Storm decks were using the sack lands that were printed in Invasion. Uh, was that in Apocalypse, maybe? Where it would tap to make one color of mana, and it would sacrifice to make... Uh, two mana of the enemy colors of the first color. Uh, they were interesting lands. But basically a storm deck would play a couple of these tap lands, then it would sacrifice two or three of them at the same time, give a big initial burst of mana to try to go off. And I could see something similar happening in Standard. Um, so I wouldn't count these out necessarily as having a role to play in some explosive mana deck in Standard. Then we've got the Storage Counter lands. Now I know at first glance they look much too slow to impact the game, but something we have access to in Standard is Proliferate. Um, so if you've got a little bit slower of a deck, something that can control the board a little bit, you could get one of these tap lands down, start building up the storage counters on it to, you know, go to some explosive mana count later in the game. And if you're playing proliferate cards alongside of it, um, you can be giving yourself a mana advantage at the same time. So when you eventually do choose to untap the land, it'll be even more mana than it would have been otherwise. So I don't know for sure if either of these has a home, but they've both got potential. And again, there's uh, one of these for every color. Number nine, we've got sideboard tech. This is Thelen's Curse. So this is a enchantment for two green. Uh, it says blue creatures don't untap during their controller's untap steps. I know that seems very narrow, but this is cheap to get down, and one of the uh, best decks in the format right now is in uh, Obscura Colors. You know, it uses um, Rafine. It uses um, the 2-3 lifelinker for a white and a blue. Um, there are definitely blue creatures in that deck, and there are other decks in Standard that this could come out of your sideboard and also uh, screw up quite a bit. It only costs one blue to untap them, but just that little extra tax is throwing them off of being able to deploy more threats to the board, to have their counter spells at the ready. Uh, it's something that could add up a lot over the course of the game. So if there is a match where there are blue creatures threatening you, then uh, this could be some great sideboard tech in standard. Number eight, we've got Sea Singer. Uh, this is another kind of sideboard tech card where uh, you can only gain control of a creature if its controller has an island. But if there's a way that you could do this temporarily, you could use this proactively, even if the opponent does not run islands. Right? They don't have to have a blue creature in this case, so as long as you can cause them to gain control of an island, or have an island even temporarily, then the Sea Singer can steal a creature. And we've got some great ways to protect the Sea Singer in Standard. Um, there's a lot of good one-mana blue cards that can make her hexproof. Um, you know, phasing her out would make you uh, lose control of the creature, but then she can just steal it right back again. So this could be a sideboard card. It could also maybe be a main deckable strategy. 
And number seven, we've got Basal Thrall. This can cause explosive mana um, for a mono black deck or a deck that's mostly black. So it's a one, two for two. You can tap and sacrifice it to add two black to your mana pool. So this creature can ramp you um, as long as you make your land drop on turn three, you could hit five mana. And I don't know about you, but I can think of a lot of different things that that could uh, let me do in a game. Um, just for your consideration, um, Gix's command could sweep the opposing side of the field as a sweeper that you suddenly have access to because you made all this extra mana. And you can choose to pull creatures back from your graveyard. You have at least one down there because there's the basal thrall you sacrificed. There are many other interesting play patterns this card could open up. At number six, we've got Turbo Fog. So Spore Flower um, builds up a Spore Counter during your upkeep. You can remove three Spore Counters to prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. I know that seems like it's a little bit too slow, but there's a couple of things at work here. One, there's a two mana green enchantment in Fallen Empires that can just pay two green and you put a Spore Counter on target Fungus. So that means if you have four mana available, that this will gain a counter on your upkeep. You can pay four mana to add two Spore Counters to it, and you can fog the opponent for the rest of the game if they can't get rid of your Spore Flower. And green has plenty of ways to make something hexproof and indestructible. On top of the Spore Flower, there's also a Spore Cloud. So it's a three mana instant. It taps all blocking creatures, um, and then it prevents all combat damage that will be dealt this turn. So then each attacking creature and each blocking creature doesn't untap during the next untap step. So this is not just a fog, um, it's also a giant tap down effect. So Spore Cloud is a heck of a tempo play. Um, and having access to both Spore Cloud and the Spore Flower. Spore Flower you can also proliferate. That's another way you could up the counters on the Spore Flower. Between these two, um, Turbo Fog is back with a vengeance. Number five, we've got High Tide. This card was used to uh, power some mana engine combos in older formats of the game. Uh, it's not for certain that we're going to be able to do that in standard, but anything that produces a bunch of extra mana, like this card can, uh, potentially there's some way to break it. So whether that's ramping out some giant blue spell early, like, um, was it one with the multiverse? Uh, the eight mana enchantment from Brothers War, or just some other giant targets. Um, there are a lot of things you could imagine spending a bunch of blue mana to cast. So I don't know if this will get there, but it sure seems like it has the potential. Number four, Ication Javelineers. This unassuming little card is good enough to see play in legacy formats, in, you know, the eternal formats of the game. It is a 1-1 one, one for 1. It's a human soldier, so it's got some relevant creature types already. Comes in with a javelin counter and can tap to deal 1 damage to any target by removing that javelin counter. Now, even without any special tricks, you know, even without proliferating the counter, anything like that. Just getting down a 1-1 one, one human soldier that can tap and ping something of the opponent's. There are so many one toughness creatures that are relevant in our format. There's Skrelv, there's Thalia, um, you know, the tokens of Boros tokens. There are a lot of things this could ping uh, that would meaningfully impact the board. And at the low price of one white mana, yeah, it can definitely see play in standard too. Number three, we've got Goblin Grenade. Uh, even though we don't have a dedicated goblin deck in standard, there are enough competitive goblins running around that we should be able to power up a card that can deal 5 damage for 1 red. So, this can sacrifice a goblin to deal 5 damage to any target. The rate is obviously amazing. It costs you, you know, 2 cards in 1 effectively. Um, maybe you make token goblins or something. There are ways to do that. 
this card certainly got the chops. It can slot into uh, some decks like, you know, Boros Tokens. They make the goblins. Um, or it can slot into Mono Red. They just have to take a little bit more of a goblin bent. I uh, This card is definitely going to see play. Uh, it's going to change the tempo of the format dramatically. So what do you do in the face of those amazing aggro deck uh, drops? Well, you can reanimate Atraxa on turn two. This is Soul Exchange. So as an additional cost to cast this, you have to exile a creature you control. So you have to jump through a little bit of a hoop. And then you return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. If you happen to exile a Thrall, it gets a plus two, plus two counter, but that's not even necessary. So just within Mono Black, there is a Rat which uh, mills an, a, a target player for two cards. When it dies, it gives a creature minus one, minus one. So even within Mono Black, you can have an opening where you start with the rat on turn one, mill yourself two cards, get a lucky hit, and exile the rat on turn two and soul exchange back something big out of your graveyard, like a Traxa. Or Toxrel. If you're willing to uh, go more expensive on your mana base, maybe you could fit in like Rubble Belt Maverick, something that adds a bit of Surveil to your deck. Or, uh, you know, use some other cards that cause some milling or surveilling. Basically, you need to find some way to get a creature on the field and a big creature into the graveyard. But the price of only two black mana means even if you take additional turns of setup to where you can't quite do it on turn two, it's still really good to do this on turn three or turn four. So I'm certain that this card is going to find a home in Standard. And finally, the big one that's going to change everything um, is Him to Torok. So people have been not that afraid of uh, discard spells in recent times. You know, there's the bat. The bat's annoying. But if you're running enough board sweepers, eventually you'll sweep up the bat and get your card back. Most other uh, discard spells are... You know, sometimes they have some marginal utility against a control deck. This one has utility against every deck that you play. And if you're thinking, well, I don't need that many cards. They all get out of my hand so quickly, you know, and Boros tokens. Consider this play pattern. You are on the draw. The opponent starts with a turn one swamp. You... You know, play down a land, play a one drop, say go. Turn two, they play another swamp, they cast him to Torok, targeting you. And you think, well, okay, that's fine. I've got six cards in my hand. What are the odds they're going to hit something that uh, trips me up here? And then you discard both of the lands out of your hand to where you have no lands left in your hand. You untap back to your turn, you draw... The top deck is not a land either. Now you're stuck on one. This is the same kind of play pattern that players have seen since the eldest days of magic because of random discard from effects like him to Torok. It can hit the lands out of your hand. It can randomly hit whatever the most valuable thing is in your hand. And just the ability to mana screw the opponent with the random discard, takes this card up to an echelon that um, modern Magic players have not seen out of discard for a long, long time. It's also at a good price. You know, if it was just discard two cards that weren't random for two black mana, that would still be a pretty um, aggressively costed discard spell. But the fact that they're random makes this a total game changer, and it's going to change the way that Standard plays for the whole time that it's legal in the format. Um, what do you all think? Uh, do you agree with my choices for the top 10 of Fallen Empires? Are there some cards that you think could have more hidden impact than some of the ones that I have listed? Um, sound off, let me know in the comments. And, you know, you can also like and subscribe helps out the channel, check out my other videos. Until next time, never stop honing your critical thinking and empathy on this day of April the 1st.